Okay. So carry on. I'm sorry. Hello and welcome. This is episode six of the Paul Ryder Tapes. As we all know, he sadly passed away in July of 2022, but in the months leading up to his death, he sat down with me, his ex-wife, Angela Smith, to tell his whole life story, warts and all, and oh my goodness, that's exactly what he did. We had no idea he was going to die so soon, and we literally finished recording his story just 12 days before he passed away. Coming up in this episode... Out of that became a record that people started to play, and the word indie dance came about. Oh, she threw an Alexa in the bin, because she oh. said it was spying on her. Oh. The flat was, when we left there, it was basically condemned, you know what I mean? You should have seen the state of the place. Yeah, G-man, because his dad was a policeman. Right. As in government man. Right. And squirrel, because his mum, when she ate, she looked like a squirrel. And they said the only request for Martin Annett was no Ford or no red car, because he hated red Fords. So of course me and Paul requested a red Ford and got one. We pulled up at his house in Charlton, Martin was outside smoking. And he just went, yeah, pair of bastards. We're, we're going to get on fine. And we did. Uh, he was the one. Squirrel and G-man John Cale, um, how do you feel that relationship worked with him as a producer? Um, he got us to play, um, we must have played each song at least 10, 15 times mm -hmm. after each other in, in a row. Mm. So he got us, he got us as, as a tight unit for playing and recording live, which, which that album was, it was recorded all live and overdubs put on later. Why did they, why did he choose to do it that way, do you think? I, I don't know, maybe it's kind of an old school way of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, he must have been old school. Is that the way the Velvets used to do their albums? It would have been, yeah. 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 Um, all live. Yeah. Which is probably why they're so good and so different. Authentic. Authentic, yeah, yeah. So he got us to play, I don't think he really got the band. He didn't get us as a band. In what sense? as our, our little unit of just the, us six. The vibe. The vibe, our humour. Um, you didn't get your jokes and your references. Well, it's a different uh, culture, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we were bothered about, we had three weeks in London paid for. We were in this bed sit with a load of Geordie builders. We used to go back at night and just drink with them till the early hours. Don't forget he'd been in New York for untold years. Yeah. I mean, he's from Wales originally. He went to study uh, viola in, in New York. Right, I didn't know that. And that's, that's how the Velvets, that's how he joined the Velvet Underground. It was like a community studio, and John Cale was in there, and he was, he was, going, through, he was going through a clean period, he was drink, eating clementines all day, and extra strong mints, and we were just getting started, drinking, drug-taking and smoking, you know, so we, it, was, it, was a, it was a clash from the start. He didn't get us. And he produced us well and made us play better. Uh, but us as a group of lads, being quite childish. <laughs> <laughs> was he a lot older than you? Yeah, John Kell was a lot older than us and been through a lot of shit himself. Uh, we recorded everything and he said, that's it. And then we went the next day and he said, no, let's start again. Was he like a father figure to you then when that was going on? You're not really a father figure. Just... Was he into you though? Did he, did he like what you were doing? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We didn't really have much contact with him, didn't really get on with him that much, didn't really have a lot of, he said, in real, he said I think he was a bit, yeah, we didn't really, he didn't really make a lot of connection with him, really. Have you ever had any communication with him since? No, never. A bit disappointing, really. What do you think of the work that he did? Probably good for what he could get out of us. Never. I have read that he said... Working with the Mondays was like having a 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle <laughs> um, and, like, pieces of it missing oh. when you got to the end. He was, he was good. He was just probably us. 
Okay. So you couldn't really finish it. We're not, they weren't the easiest to work with. Do you think that the album ma makes it feel that way? I don't think he was talking about the music. I think he was talking about us. Right. As people. Okay, a few brain cells missing, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Would you like to see him again? Yeah, I'd like to see him again. Tell him thank you. He made us play better. He prepared us for lots of shows, which is what came next. And the album got released? The album got it? released, got great critical acclaim. Yeah. Which was fantastic. We was getting five stars out of five stars in reviews. There was a music show later at night. We got featured on that, which was brilliant. I think it was on, on ITV, but it went all across England, right, not okay. just the Northwest thing. And how was that then, doing your first TV? We wasn't actually doing it. It was just a report on the album. Right. About the, about the album title and how good it was. And, you know, it was great listening to it. You know, it was yeah. finally getting somewhere. I remember waking up one morning, um, probably in the summer of 86. I remember watching Breakfast Telly. And I remember when that first single 24 hour people came out and I remember it was on bbc and obviously i knew paul was in happy mondays then i remember list i remember that being on on the news and thinking wow he's made it tell me about the album title everyone wanted to call it something different yeah so we just put all the titles together oh okay i wanted i wanted it to be called white out which is at the end of the title in right. brackets Sean wanted 24-hour party people right? because we didn't have the song by then. Okay. We, had to, we wrote the song after the album. Okay. Uh, someone else wanted a plastic face. I think PD wanted a plastic face, can't smile. Uh, <laughs> so we just put them all together. Who was Squirrel and G-Man? Squirrel and G-Man was PD's parents. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. G-Man because his dad was a policeman. Right. As in government man. Right. And squirrel because his mum, when she ate, she looked like a squirrel. So the album title ended up being what? 24 hour party people, plastic face can't smile. No. No. 24 no. Hour squirrel and G man. Oh, squirrel and G man. 24 hour party people, plastic face can't smile, white out. Brilliant. Yeah. And Genius. I think it's one of the longest album titles uh, ever. And how did Factory feel about that? Loved it. Really? Yeah, that was we were spoiled by a factory. They let us do anything we wanted. But you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have been the magic that you were without that freedom. No, definitely not. They let us uh, they let us grow up in public, <laughs> 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 which was a good thing and a bad thing. At the end of the day, right band, right place, right time. Knowing Tony, I bet he was kind of the lead conspirator. I bet he was, you know, pulling the, the strings as if to say, like, a bit more of this, guys, a bit more of that, you know. Um, and that's a good thing because that makes them feel part of the family. And right. there was, a, there was a, gr a good camaraderie with Factory. And yeah. Tony was a great guy. to fr In the same way that, you know, Rob Gretton was perfect to manage New Order, but they wouldn't have been the band with the yeah. legacy that they have without the infrastructure around them. Right manager, right label right lead singer, right bass player. Every every piece of the yeah. pie was perfect, I think. But even, like, being able to call an album that yeah. was incredible, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, um, if you'd been signed to Sony, they wouldn't have allowed you to do that. Not at all. They wouldn't, yeah. have, got, they wouldn't have got it, but Factory was just total artistic freedom. And what did Tony say, can you remember? About the album yeah. title? He loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Brilliant. When did you first go on his show? I don't think we did Granada Reports. It was it was his other show. The other side of midnight. The other side of midnight. Yeah. That was really brilliant. That show. Wasn't yeah. It? Yeah. And what yeah. was the song that you performed on that? A song called Performance. Right. Which, which was, was on Squirrel and G Man. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. They were on. The, I think it was the other side of midnight that Tony Wilson did. Um, my dad had come out of hospital quite poorly. And he, no, that was my mum. She was saying about, oh, I want to see them on the telly. And it was the week after she died that they made it onto the other side of midnight. 
I think Tony introduced us by saying, what does he say to that? This isn't nepotism, it's pure devotion to the cause or something. I think, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but something like that. So, no, we just thought we got on it because it was Tony, it was factory, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you got critical acclaim for that. Did gig offers start coming in, like proper gig offers after that? Yeah, don't forget we only had 12 months on the Enterprise Allowance Scheme to get, oh. a, rec to get a record deal, to start earning money. And to start doing shows, and yeah. it kind of all fell in place nicely within the 12 months. Oh, wow! Yeah, Maggie Thatcher would be proud of you. Maggie Thatcher was a success on the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. So, by the time that was coming to an end, you know, we was back on the dole, or we was making a business of it right. music business. Yeah, and we started to make a business of it. We started to get more and more shows, yeah. which meant money was coming in, which meant we could put ourselves on a wage. We did lots of gigs and stuff. I know my favourite of all the gigs we ever did, of course, is the one at King George's Hall in Blackburn, which uh, I don't know. People will probably know about it. The one where uh, Bev knocked uh, um, a bloke's teeth out with the maracas. The play on stage, someone threw a pint pot, right? Uh, you know one of those with the handle on the side, with dimples, and it hit PD on the head when he was playing the keyboard, and PD just walked off stage and said, I'm not fucking going out there because someone hit me with a pint pot. And I made him go back on and carry on playing, right? And then someone jumped up on stage and grabbed the mic off Sean and did Zeke Heil, Zeke Heil, and did the Hitler salute. And Benz went and smashed his teeth out with maracas. And then the police came and broke up the, the gig. And the Mondays were nearly getting arrested. We managed to explain our ways out of it and all the rest of it. Wow. So, and what about merch? Were you making merch money at that point? Not at that point, no. That came a, a year or so later when the when show you, started to get bigger. When did you first start establishing a fan base? When the 12 inch singles was coming out. The rock and roll mums always went to the record shop to buy those 12 inch singles, but more recently Sandra's flirted with a more modern way of listening, but it didn't last long. Oh, she threw an Alexa in the bin because she oh. said it was spying on her. Oh, I can't be doing me that bloody Alexa. Every time I wanted to, it kept, kept interfering when I was talking. I was your trip to Swinson. So she yeah. threw it in the bin. I said, said hey, spying she's on spying on me, so I pulled it, unplugged it and put it in the bin. For our first fan base was Leeds and Glasgow. Right. Leeds and Glasgow, we had a following more than we did in Manchester. Really? Why in do the you early think that day. was? Don't know, but they all seem to like music in Glasgow. They I love you, live music. You always said Glasgow's always a great gig. Never, never had a bad show in Glasgow. Wow. Never. Amazing. Yeah, the Glaswegians loved it. They love live music. Yeah. I don't know, I did a few weeks on her, mm -hmm. but she was getting very, she was getting naughty, wasn't she, Linda, really? Because she was interrupting me when I was talking, mm -hmm. which is fatal, as we know. And if I wanted music on, she wasn't putting the music on, I wanted. But you've got to say, oh, similar. I didn't want similar, though. And Leeds, just because of the, uh, maybe the way we dressed. You know, there was, there was a lot of people in Leeds dressing the same way as we dressed. Right. Were you were you friends with the Sheffield lot that were coming up at that time, like bands like Pulp and the Human League and ABC? And No, the Human League and ABC was before, before our time. Right. They, they was having hits a few years before. Heaven 17. Heaven 17. That Penthouse and Pavement album's it's great. I listened it? to it yeah. recently. Yeah. And it is so good. Yeah. Really, really good. But I liked all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you have to, if you don't pay for it, you've got to say, or oh, similar. I know. So they'll include what you've asked for. But, but if I want Elvis, I want Elvis. I don't want some Tim Pop daft man singing Elvis. What other stuff were you into at that point? And it, you've told us about your musical influences from childhood, but around the time of Squirrel and G-Man, what were you listening to? Probably a lot of The Doors. I'd gone back to my old record collection. I'd gone back to The Doors and back to The Stones. And what was influencing you musically at that point? Probably that stuff. Yeah. That stuff. Yeah. Well, and what did it? I asked for Rock Around the Clock and this crappy band she put on. Put up. That is final. I unplugged it and threw it in bin. So, Squirrel and G-Man had come out. You'd started to do gigs and mm -hmm. tours. Mm -hmm. And so the next step 
presumably was the next album. Another album. Or did you release some EPs before that? We wrote the song 24 Hour Party People. It came out after Squirrel and Gmail. Tell me the story of that song. The music came from me ripping off another Motown bass line and not being able to get it right because, like I said, <laughs> I didn't know what the notes were and it ended up being my own bass line. And Sean just started singing over, um, started singing 24 Hour Party People. And you'd already coined that phrase, yeah. presumably. Where had the phrase come from? Who made that up? I think that was our mate Mini, not Salford Mini, there was another Mini, Mini from Walkden, and that's why he used to call me Sean and Bez, the 24-hour right. party people. But what it was that annoyed me, she was spying on me, she knew what I was doing, she'd go, hello, have you been to such a place? I thought, how does she know I've been there? And I thought, no, I'm not having that. No. I, think Put I think Putin has something to do with it. <laughs> Everything on Putin, don't we, Linda? Oh. <laughs> so at this point, Sean had split up from Denise and the three yeah. of you were living together. You, Bez and Sean all shared a flat. All shared a one-bedroom flat. It was great in them days. It was fantastic because, uh, you know, we we, we, we uh, young, we had fucking dreams, we, we was having great times, great parties, you know, really enjoying ourselves. And what was that like? Oh, my goodness, I can't imagine. Oh, well, it got to the point where... Nobody would clean up. The flat was, when we left there, it was basically condemned, you know what I mean? You should have seen the state of the place. Nobody would wash dishes. There was fungi growing where fungi has never been seen growing before. But every, every couple of months, we'd run the bath. Uh, we had, one day we did decide to do the pots and we had to fill the bath up with, uh, you no know, debt or like, you no know, to clean the pots in. And put all the dishes in a bath. <laughs> and, uh, the, and the side mark, you know, because the three of us had to get in a bath. And that, because there wasn't enough room in the kitchen. And the fucking towels used to stink. Oh, no. So we'd have to grab all the cups, the glasses. The glasses was full of cigarette ends and... Oh. Used to be a thick, crusty side mark round the bath because no one ever used to clean the bath. Yeah, you know, and, and mouldy food. You weren't going to impress any young bird anyway coming in. <laughs> so what was your life like? What was your average day like around that time? Average day. Waking up, smoking weed, listening to music listening to records, waiting for the night time for the pubs to open. Uh, and then after the pub, you go into Manchester. And do what? Hacienda. Yeah. Or the Ritz. Yeah. Or uh, what else would have been? Uh, Legends. Talk about the Hacienda, because, I mean, it's the most probably the most iconic nightclub in the whole of the world. I remember going there on my 21st birthday and sitting there in my coat because it was so cold. Absolutely. And no one was there, yeah. Absolutely freezing and empty, but looks so cool yeah. and had the best music. Yeah. You know, that, that place lost money every time it opened for years yeah. until all the rave scene happened. Yeah. You know, even when it even when it was a venue for shows, you know, it wasn't selling out. No. You know, I saw loads of bands there to an half empty audience. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So do you remember like was that your kind of hub where you gathered and you yeah. met all your friends? Yeah. Yeah, we met a lot, I met a lot of people in that place. Yeah. Yeah. What do you remember a particular night that was very memorable? A night called the Temperance Night, which was Mike Pickering and um, Andrew Berry, who, well, was, who, who was the in-house hairdresser at the Hacienda. So it was a nightclub that also had a hairdressers in it? In the basement during yeah. the day, yeah, wow. in the dressing rooms. Yeah, amazing. And Andrew would cut hair if he was there and he wasn't off touring with the Smiths to do Morris's hair yeah. or going down to the top of the pops to do Johnny's hair and Morris's hair. Yeah. You know, that's, Were that's you friends with Johnny? Uh, no, not for not for years later. Yeah. You know, I had, I'd never met him. Yeah. No. Who were your contemporaries in Manchester at the time? Oh, God, there's so many bands, so many bad ones. Um, the Roses were around at the same time, we, you? The Roses was around at the same time, but they were slightly... It's not 
Tony didn't like Tony Wilson didn't like them because he thought they was goths. Stone Roses were slightly gothy when they first started. They also started buying clothes from me and our kid and started dressing like the Mondays. <laughs> <coughs> and I had to explain to him that they're not goths. Yeah. You know, but give them a chance, you'll like them. Yeah. You know, and the next thing, they're on the same TV show as we was on. Yeah. You know, um, so he gave them a chance and there wasn't goths, thank yeah. God. Um, but it was hundreds of bands at the time, hundreds. Who who did he particularly like at that point in, in uh, from the Manchester scene? Just New Order. Yeah. No, no others, really. Yeah. There was like, I saw them all as a threat. Did you? Was yeah. it like rivalry? Oh yeah, yeah. They're playing at that venue. We should be playing at that venue, not there. Yeah. Who were you most kind of envious of? I suppose the Bodines got into the charts and we didn't. Yeah. You know, with our songs, so it was like, oh, how come they got they signed to a major? And it was like, is it because we're on Factory, we're not having a hit record, or yeah. is it because we're not on a major? Yeah. Um, but it was like, oh God, they just. Uh, They've just got in a top 40. Remember you became the darlings of the enemy and Melody Maker kind of overnight. What What mm. do you think it was that prompted them to take notice? Simply because there was nobody else like us. I kind of naively thought they were going to be like every other band in Manchester. And it was only once I'd seen them play and met them that I kind of realised that they were a proper one-off maverick type gang and were nothing like all the other bands so i was in a kind of position where if there was a band i really liked i could push them and i have to say that a lot of manchester bands i was not that interested in because they were at that point there were quite a lot of bands who sounded a bit like the smiths what was the catalyst for them to take an interest in you what was it after 24 hour party people or yeah hallelujah or what, what was the song that really broke you do you think Probably wrote for luck. Right, and that came after 24 Hour Party People. Yeah, yeah, right. I was on Bummed. So Bummed really was the kind of the next it, main release. 24 yeah. Hour Party People was also on kind Bummed, of open, wasn't it? Opened the, it kind of opened the door a bit for us to get more shows right. and, and, and stuff like that. So who was the producer of Bummed? That was Martin Hannett. Okay, so tell us about that whole... That came about because of... Um, Alan Erasmus, yeah. who, if anyone knows anything about Factory, they'll, they'll have heard of Tony Wilson, Rob Gretton, but maybe not Alan. Alan was the third partner, and he was the quiet one, yeah. but always came up with good ideas. Right. You know, he never did interviews, he never went out yeah. and put himself around town like Tony did, and yeah. he was the quiet one. It was, it was Alan's idea to get... Um, to get uh, Martin involved. And what was Martin's background at the time? Martin had done Joy Division. He was also involved in a record label called Rabid Records, okay. which had Jilted John. Wow. Uh, Jilted John. Uh, I know they had uh, John Cooper Clark. Rabid was, it was quite a decent sized record label for mm. an indie. I, yeah. And uh, he, was, he was partners in that. Just, just this question. Just oh, Martin So, so we hadn't met Martin on it. So, uh, Martin on it was a bass player. So we wanted me and Paul to go up first to the studio. We we booked in a studio called the Slaughterhouse in Driffield near Scarborough, North Yorkshire. So we had to pick him up. Factory hired a car, and they said the only request for Martin on it was no Ford or no red car because he hated red Fords. So of course, me and Paul requested a red Ford and got one. We pulled up at his house in Charlton, Martin was outside smoking. He just went, yeah, pair of bastards. We're, we're going to get on fine. And we did. Uh, he was the one. That was another great album. Again, working with Martin. It was up in Driftfield. Crazy. Uh, it was the height of the ecstasy explosion. Madness. So the whole band was on really good vibes, you know what I mean? Everyone was just eating each, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. Fucking the addictions aren't even entered, entered into the equation then. And he was a character, wasn't he? Tell us about Martin Hannett. Martin was, uh, he was pretty quiet, you yeah. know. By the time we worked with him, he was kind of um, 
over his whole heroin addiction, mm. put heavily into alcohol. Right. And um, so that played a big part in it. You know, I remember his wife, Wendy, saying, whatever you do, just keep him away from alcohol. Oh. Yeah. You know, the first thing, and I used to pick him up every morning to go to the studio. The first thing we'd do was go to the pub. So that didn't really work out. We're going to Driffield and it, the pubs were open. This was before the times when pubs were open all day. And the pubs were open all day. So we get to the studio and the guy said, we said, why? And the first, he said, do you want to have a look around the new studio? And we were like, no, why are the pubs open all day? And he said, uh, it's market day, they're open all day. We went, all day? He went, yeah. We went, we'll go to the pub then. He said, would you want to tour around the studio and see what equipment we've got? And we went, no. So we get to the pub. And Martin said, oh, I've not drunk, I've not drank alcohol for five years, four or five years, can't remember at the time when it was. He said, I've been on the, I've not been, I've not drank, I'll just have a Coca-Cola. Okay. I remember Paul saying, they've got a Stella on draft. So we ordered two pints of Stella and Martin, and Martin and I went, hmm, go on then, I'll have a Stella. So, so we had one, this was like three o'clock in the afternoon. Still there at half past 12 at night, midnight, we, kind of, we just drank right through the next day. And that became, we used to go there for breakfast, it was right next to the studio. We used to go there for breakfast every day, the beginning of the end. Right, and was he drunk the whole time then? Not drunk, not no. drunk, just... Was she you not know. worried that he'd go and get some heroin? If I, I don't know, I didn't, oh. I didn't go on it. Actually, yeah. I do know. Yeah, OK, you don't want to say <laughs> I understand. Um, so he was a character? Yeah. Was yeah. he a nice guy? Did you nice guy, yeah. yeah. But he was very quirky and, and eclectic, wasn't he, and unusual? Yeah, very, very clever. Yeah. Especially where sound was uh, right. where sound was uh, uh, concerned. Okay. And what was his methodology for recording? Um, he made us play live as well, but we did a hell of a lot of overdubs. Yeah. Uh, more than we did on uh, on the other album. Okay. But the basic structures was live. Yeah. And you had you prepared all the songs before you went in to record them? Yeah, we demoed them. We de we'd never demoed an album before, but we had these. We went and recorded the whole album as a demo. Why did you do that? Um, because we didn't know who was going to produce it at that time. Right. We had songs ready to be recorded. Yeah. So we went in uh, Out of the Blue, which was in Ancoats, with a studio in an old mill, which is now apartments. And we demoed it in like three or four days. Right. Uh, How I wish, did that go? Great. I wish you could find the demos. Do you think the demos are better than the produced album? Uh, if you ask Matt Carroll, he'll say yes. Yeah. Really? Uh, and I think a couple of the songs was better, but all in all, the album was better than the demos. I think we had two or three weeks in Great Driftfield. The studio came with accommodation, a little end terraced house uh -huh. where we all stayed. They put me in the drum booth, right? That was where we were sleeping, in the fucking drum booth. No air, nothing. It might have been soundproof, but it was fucking hot. You couldn't breathe. Parties all the time, don't know. And what was that like? Um, National Lampoon's um, holiday vacation. But I thought you were picking Martin Hannah up from home every That was day. when we was mixing in Strawberry Studios. Oh, OK. We right. mixed it in Strawberry in Stockport, right. but recorded in Great Driftfield. OK, let's go back to Driftfield. Tell me the Driftfield stories first. OK, so we're all staying in an then Terry's house. The studio was an old slaughterhouse. Oh. And in the, middle of the, in the middle of the studio was a cobbled street right. where all the blood used to run down. Oh. Into into the sewers, or oh. the, if they wasn't saving it to make um, black, uh, pudding. black pudding, yeah. Oh. So there was a weird street in the middle of the studio, which also had a red telephone box in there. Oh, wow. So if you if you kind of having a few drinks and some drugs, you'd go out of the studio and into this street, but you'd think you was outside. So it all got a bit confusing. I remember me and Martin, everyone else had gone to the pub. It was kind of like just before last orders. Me and Martin was in the studio and it was like, let's get to the pub for last orders. Out of the control room and into this street that was inside the studio. And it took us like 45 minutes to find our way out. <laughs> so it all got a bit confusing. Was Bez there that, at that point? Yeah, the yeah, Bez was there. In the studio. What, was oh, yeah. he, what did he contribute when you were recording? 
um, chief joint roller and um, he was just listening and right. nodding his head and, and grooving along. My recollection is also quite faint. No, it's not the best at size. Did he ever say, no, I don't like that or change no. that? Or he, he didn't interfere at all? didn't interfere with the music. Neither did Sean interfere with the music. Yeah. Yeah. So where did the music come from? Who who was kind of driving the, the writing process of the music? Um, nothing would come about until there was a bass line. Right. So usually the bass line would come first mm -hmm. and then we'd just jam along to the bass line right. and slowly knock it into the shape of a song. Right. Mm. And then Mark's bits would come. So it'd be Gaz would come along and then yeah. Mark and PD on top. Yeah. And with Mark... <coughs> We used to record us doing the song right right before it was a song. We'd jam it and just record it onto a cassette for 30 minutes. Right. Change it over another 30 minutes on the other side. The same song? Same song, just jamming away. And then we'd go through it all and pick the guitar parts out that Mark did and say, right. that bit there is great, that bit there is really good, keep right. doing that bit. So you'd got it all prepared before you went into the studio to record it with Martin then? Yeah, yeah, they okay. was all knocked into shape yeah. and we demoed them. Yeah. So you got on really well with him, did you? Yeah, got Do you think fine. he got you? I think so, yeah, yeah. So then you'd recorded it and then you went to Strawberry Studios. Tell me about Strawberry Studios. Strawberry Studios, we went there to mix it. And um, I think we was there for two weeks mixing it. And I picked Martin up in Charlton every day. And I now know 20, 24 different ways to get from from Charlton to Stockport. Yeah. Because he'd never go the same way twice. Why? He thought he was being followed. Oh, did he? <laughs> so every day he'd have a different route set out. And every night going home he'd have a different route. Wow. Never went there twice on the same route. Why did he think he was being followed? I think he was just going a bit cray cray by then. Okay. Yeah. But he was fun. Good oh yeah, great you. fun. Okay, so Bummed was released in... 88. And uh, that was the start. After that got released, that was the start of us doing or having remixes done of some of our songs. Whose idea was that? I think it was collectively because the, the club culture had started to take off, okay. especially in Ibiza with Balearic Beats right. and the DJs, the English DJs coming back from Ibiza um, and putting club nights on in London. I was DJing in a nightclub called The Future, so I would play The Cure next to um, Grandmaster Flash and The Furious Five next to Bob Marley. The, the club was based around when I went to Ibiza, and experienced the Balearic sound that it became to be known, which is basically all kinds of great music together. So I would play at this club, hence why the, it's called Rope for Luck is the title, but it's called The Future Mix. And I sampled Prince at the end from the movie Batman, which in those days you could get away with samples I mean, there's an NWA sampling and there's a lot going on in that track, but it works really, really well. And it blew up. And as I say, the media then were going, oh, you, you, indie dance, indie dance. Okay, it's indie dance. And then our relationship started to grow. Um, that was all like acid and ecstasy. <clears throat> and Ecstasy, Balearic beat and chill out grooves and, and, uh, and stuff like that. What was your favourite track off that album? Wrote for Look and Do It Better. Oh, yeah. Do It Better. Do It Better, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wrote for Look, I remember being a massive club hit. Yeah. In the indie clubs. I remember dancing to that in London mm -hmm. and wondering who had done it. That like was, it was such a catchy hook. And it was, went on and on and on and on and on. That was our first remix, I think. Right. Was that f the guy from Erasure, Vince, Vince? Vince Clark did a version. Yeah. And... Paul Oakenfold did a version. Right. Uh, Who did you prefer? Um, I like Vince Clark's version. Yeah. I thought that was fantastic. Did you meet him? No, never met him. No. No. What about Oki? Did you meet him? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, at this point, did you meet him, or was it all done remotely? 
No, but every time we was in London, we went to his club where he was DJing, so we met him. It was like, man, these guys are great. I mean, they, 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 I think because we were all into clubs, maybe they weren't into clubs for the club music, but they were in the Hacienda. They were in the clubs. And what did you think of him? He was a soul boy, so he was yeah. wearing sports jackets and had like a mullet. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like him? Oh, yeah, I thought he was great. Yeah? Yeah, wasn't too keen on his dress sense. I got asked to remix Rope for Luck. That's where our relationship started. <clears throat> I listened to the original. It didn't work for DJs, not just myself, but the rhythm was all wrong. Um, and and that was the beginning of, of my relationship with the Mondays, with Gary, the drummer, um, was rhythm. It didn't work for the dance floor. So when I did Rope for Luck, I'm like, OK, I need to change the drums, I need to make it more melodic, I need the structure needs to, to change, and that's what I did. And out of that became a record that people started to play, and the word indie dance came about because you could finally dance to indie music. Tell me about when you first discovered ecstasy. When was that? Ooh, probably about 87. Okay, what happened? Um, friends of ours came back from Amsterdam with um, quite a few thousand of them. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, and was... One of the first, there was friends of ours was the first, one of the first groups of people to start selling them to um, friends. And it kind of grew from there. Right. Do you remember your first one? First one, yeah, it was amazing. I never had anything like it. What did it make you feel? Euphoric. Yeah. Euphoric. And everything sounded better. <laughs> All the music sounded better. And, um,. So, yeah, probably about 87, maybe 86. So do you think the Monday's music would have been very different had it not been for ecstasy and psychedelics? Um, I don't know which, I don't know where it would have gone, but it would have gone somewhere. Yeah. But it's just um, happenstance that that drug came along at the same time as we was getting into remixes. Because at that time you were really a true indie band you, your music would be defined as being indie and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden these dance grooves started appearing it, indie dance yeah in, a new indie genre dance, indie dance crossover i think yeah. you referred to on mtv yeah yeah um so whose idea was it to take this indie sound and danceify it up well like i said the club culture was getting bigger and bigger and these DJs was, was starting to mix indie music with with uh, Balearic beats in in London. So we'd go down to London um, and uh, go into these clubs where Oakenfold was playing and Andy Weatherall and uh, Ian St. Paul um, and loads of... We, we, we'd be visiting London um, and it was just... By this time, we've got Nathan McGough managing us. Okay, how did that come about? What happened <clears throat> to Phil Sachs? Phil, at the time, was married with children and had his job selling clothes. So he couldn't give us 100%. Right. You know, and he admitted that. You know, he, he said he had a, you know, he had a, a, a house to pay for, kids, schools. Yeah. and So he couldn't give us 100%. So it was time to get a full-time manager. I was still working, selling jeans and stuff, so it was difficult to be a full-time manager. Um, and in reality, I think Bummed is where it really took off. And I think the Manchester thing was starting. You had Hallelujah and the remixes and the dance music and ecstasy. That's when the Mondays took off. And when the Hacienda wow. changed from being that art to arty to being a drug fueled nightclub, really. <laughs> How did you find Nathan? Nathan was a character around Manchester, um, from Liverpool, son of Roger McGough, the poet, from the scaffold. 
And Thelma McGough, who was the producer of Blind Date. She was. His mum was produced Blind Date. And Nathan was managing a band I mentioned before, the Bodines, right. that had signed to a major label and, and nearly had a hit record. Oh, it got in the top 40 at least, I think. Um, <clears throat> so somebody suggested him. It was like, OK, he's done, he's done good with that other band. Maybe he'll be good for us and he's going to be full time. Do you remember meeting him for the first time? Yeah. What he had happened? A, he had a Motorhead T-shirt on and a, a leather biker jacket, which none of us liked. Oh, did he nearly not get the job? He nearly he didn't get the job. <laughs> um, but we, we needed a full time manager and he was available. And yeah. we got on well with him. Yeah. Yeah. And Remember he, he had a very long handshake. When he shook your hand, oh, really? he held it for a lot longer than would be normal to do. Oh. Or maybe that was just me. I don't know. I don't know. Probably just you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, he's managing us at this time. And he's coming out to the clubs with us. And um, after, after Bond got released, it was... All of us saying we need a remix, and we chose Wrote for Look right. to get the remix done. Yeah. And, um, Vince Clark did one version, Paul Oakenfold, and uh, Steve Osborne, who was Paul Oakenfold's right hand man in the studio. Steve's genius, quiet genius. Um, they did a version. And I remember getting the test pressing 12 inch rope for look and putting it on in the rehearsal room and just being blown away by it. Yeah. It was like, wow, okay, this is cool. That's, um, cause it was more programmed, um, programmed keyboards and drum loops yeah. and, and stuff like that. And it blew us all away. Did you I, realize at that point that you were being catapulted into a slightly different direction musically? Yeah. Yeah, I knew straight away. As soon as I heard that remix, it was like, OK, I know where I'm going now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have felt pretty good. Yeah, it was really good. Do you good. remember the first time you were ever in a club and you heard it being played and pe saw people dancing to it? Mm -hmm. I remember the first ever record, the delightful one, on a Tuesday night in the Hacienda. I remember that being played oh. and thinking, wow, I've never heard it so loud. And did people dance? Yeah, people was dancing. Yeah. That uh, was a nice moment. Yeah, must be a pretty good feeling when that happens. Mm -hmm. Really good. Yeah. So the remixes were released and that brought you lots more attention and, beca and you became club, a, a club record. You became a club band. You became yeah. an indie dance crossover. And after the, after the Bummed album, we, we released another 12-inch single, which was remixes of the songs we'd just written. Ray, Rave on, there was only Rave on. Oh, Rave I remember on. the Hallelujah remix came yeah. out when I was at MTV and that was in 1990. Right. That's okay. when you went to Iceland. Right, this is 89 when Rave on came out. Right. When we were doing the, the Rave on EP, Man Manchester, Manchester Rave on EP, well, we didn't know what it was called that then. And the guy from the Daily Telegraph came down to interview us. And he's all that Tony Wilson like because. He spoke about me and Paul changing music, indie music to dance music rather than talking about anything else. So he liked that because it's a bit different. And the guy came, and the interview was a Saturday morning at 9.30. So no one got, oh, we've been, we've been in the studio till two, drinking till six. But Paul said, no, it's a Daily Telegraph, it's a broadsheet. It's pretty, you know, we've got to do it. So we turned up, and I remember it was in there like a, a conservatory with all these old records and record players. And me and Paul kind of trumbled, trumbled in there, hung over, I mean, cups of tea. The guy turned up, was interviewing us. And he said, what kind of music are you listening to? So Paul, the, you know, Paul's like his record collection. He's like a shoe collection, you know, shoes and records. They started talking about records and music. And the guy wanted to know about music rather than about the band. And it, which, so that, that was right up Paul Street, you know, couldn't stop him. He was, and then he's asking us what we're working on. And we was actually working on the song Rave On. And uh, he said, what's the song called you're working on the EP? And Paul just picked up this Buddy Ollie album and went, Rave On from Buddy Ollie. And then after that, the guy and then the, 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 guy, the guy wrote about it saying, oh, he's called it Rave On because they go, they go to raves. Now, I'm not sure whether that's the first time they were called. Because they were called all nighters and they weren't called raves before then. Whether that was 
when they started calling them raves or whether it was just that was a coincidence but around about that time it was about Buddy Holly and I knew why because he didn't want to look like he, he didn't know what because Sean did, came up with the titles of the songs but he didn't want to be caught off guard like not knowing you know what I mean so he, he was kind of looking and he had a Buddy Holly he went rave on and afterwards I said to him why did you say that he said just come on you know okay and I don't you know so um, uh, that 12 inch was just remixes of songs we'd recorded with Martin Hannah. Right. We just sent them straight off to uh, Oakenfold and Osborne. Right. So it was 89. And how many tracks were on that EP? I think it was just three. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that cemented your future as indie the, dance crossover indie. artists, effectively. That's, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So in 1990, mm -hmm. the Hallelujah remix was released in Europe. I right. remember. Okay. And you went to Iceland to do a show. Where we, that's where we met. That's where we met. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I was at MTV and um, you'd just been on Top of the Pops with the Roses because I remember talking about that in my job interview and I got the job mm. and I remember sitting and reading Melody Maker or The Enemy and there was a double page feature on you. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading about you and thinking... Oh, they sound like naughty boys. It was always the whole kind of press um, perception of you was that you were scallies and that you were stealing and mm. that you were bad. And um, but I remember knowing that you were from Little Holton, mm -hmm. um, for, well, from kind of Manchester. So I remember going to my bosses when I saw you were playing in Iceland. I was like. We have to go and do this because mm. they're going to be huge. Thanks. I remember interviewing Sean in the Blue Lagoon and he had his ecstasy tattoo on his arm that was yeah. spelt wrong. Ecstasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's still got it. Well, he would. It's a tattoo, isn't it? No, he never had it inked it's out. Corrected. Never had it corrected. Paul was a lovely, lovely bloke. You know, I mean, it's a great shame, isn't it? Because, you know... It's someone you count, not as someone you manage, a client, as it were, but someone who is a friend. Yeah, no, it's very, very sad. You know, I got on really, really well with the whole band. And, yeah, we'd have the odd argument. I remember throwing a party seven at Sean's head um, at a gig in Coventry. Last Sunday, I was going to the Wolves match, United game. I wasn't going for the turnstile. The girl in the turnstile says, oh, I like your glasses. And I thought, oh, thank you very much. She said, oh, don't you look like Sean Ryder? I said, there's a story there, isn't there? <laughs> Yvonne says, God forbid you should look like Sean Ryder. OK, we're almost at the end of the episode, but have a look at what's coming up next time. When you're in the studio, and Paul was the same, you like to have nobody around, just go in and do your bit. And uh, next thing I turn around and um, it's a card out of uh, the cult. Ian Ashbury was behind. Bloody and people walking in and out. Well, what's going on here then? <laughs> they marched us off at gunpoint to this blooming warehouse with plants and all sorts. And the clubs I was playing at at that time, people were like, "Yeah, call the cops." and it wouldn't mean call the cops, it would it would mean, you know, it's going off, we're having a great time. When you have the disease of addiction, mm. you have a built-in sabotage button. When everything's going great, you'll sabotage it because you don't feel worthy. That wasn't funny, Dave. We was, we was going to do a bit of swapping and changing, weren't we? So I think I was going to go and play the drums for the Mondays and someone was going to come do something for the, play the bass for the Roses and, and so on. Never quite got round to it, but uh, it would have been a, a, a good jolly jape. OK, we're playing out with another Big Arm track. This one's called Scar 3000. Watch out for the Big Arm album, which is, I promise, being released any day now. Thank you so much to all of the fab guests and, of course, to you for being with us. We really appreciate you. 
please carry on spreading the word about the Paul Ryder tapes and please subscribe to this YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything and give us a nice review and rating if you've not already done so. The website is paulrider.tv and that's got links to all of the socials as well as a really fun shop with some really brilliant merch and a way to send us a voice note if you'd like to share your memories of Paul in the show. Please join us again next week, same time, same place, where the next video will be premiered at 8pm UK time or noon Pacific time here on YouTube. And if you'd like to listen to the next episode in podcast form, it's available right now on all of the podcast platforms. Remember, we now drop new episodes every Sunday night at 9pm UK time or 1pm Pacific time on Sunday. So head over to a podcast platform now if you want to catch the next episode. Thank you again to all of you for being here, but the biggest thanks, of course, must go to the late, great Paul Ryder. Come on, Mr. Rude Boy, hit me with your best shots. Then I'll get my gun and give it all the Yes, you. No, no, you like discussing.